All right, how are we doing, church? Awesome. Great. If you were standing in back and you needed seats, there are plenty of seats up front now uh, because our, our parents were here and, and they were here for two services. Praise God. We're so thankful. Isn't our children, our creative kids uh, choir just so special? Isn't it amazing? What's, what I'm seeing that's, that's even more incredible is not only are the children singing, but I don't know if you saw on the screen, I think they tried not to put it up a lot, but there, were, there was, uh, for one of the songs, one of our children were playing drums. And for another song, there was a child that was playing, at least one, playing guitar in the background. So it's cool. They're learning these, these uh, gifts and talents. And there's nothing more precious than our kids to become everything God wants them to be. That, that should be the prayer in our hearts, parents. Please join me in that prayer, that they will become everything God wants them to be. They, they won't be shaped in our image, but they'll be shaped in his image, right? Because I know it's my, even, I'm your pastor, it's my desire. I know the things that I want for my child, but I have to continue to come back to God and say, Lord, I want what you want for them. I just want them to fulfill your purpose in their lives, Lord, whatever that looks like. Come on, are you still with me? Did all the parents leave? Are you with me? All right. My name is Pastor Chris. I'm glad that you're here. Any of our new guests, can you just lift up your hand again if you're new here at Evangel? Anyone here? Welcome. We're so, I'm so glad you're here. Glad you're here. Uh, awesome. Um, man, I hope you feel at home and welcome, if, especially if it's your first time here today. Maybe you're here because someone invited you with the creative kids, or maybe, like many weeks, you just walked through the door because this was your first week at Evangel and you found out about us some way. Um, just walking through the door is, I, I believe you could learn a lot about a church and what's important to them. And you could see that we believe here at Evangel that the children are not the church of tomorrow. They're the church of today. They, are, they, they, they lead us in worship. They're a part. Whenever we have, uh, it is not babysitting on Sunday mornings during this time we're in service. It is times where they're being uh, taught and they're growing in their faith or learning more about Christ. And that's why we have great ministries, even like Wednesday night with our girls' ministry and Aurora Rangers. Um, we're just so blessed that everyone's here. It's a great time for you to join us. We are in the middle of a series called The Blessed Life. And today is part two of that series. I would encourage everyone that didn't get a chance to hear part one to go back um, on, our, um, on our Facebook page. You could find it on YouTube. You can search it and find Evangel. Um, and even on our website at evangelchurch.com, you can go back and watch previous week's messages. And I'd encourage everyone, uh, look at that first message. I think it will help you so much because here's, here's what I really believe. God wants to bless our lives. Does anyone else believe that today? God is a God who blesses, that he desires uh, to do that. It talks about it over and over and over again in his, in his word. And I believe that God desires to bless our lives. And I want to live a life that is blessed by God. I want to experience that. I don't just want to live life. I want the idea of abundant life that God promises in his word. And no, it is not the same idea of abundant life that you see on television or all kinds of other places. But I want to see a life that is full and fulfilling and fulfilled in all that God desires for me. And so we're discovering principles that are connected to having a blessed life during this series. And last week we talked about three pillars of blessing. These are key pillars that need to be present in, uh, in our lives to experience and walk out the blessing of God. And the three that I, I really talked about last Sunday was obedience, stewardship, and generosity, that these are three things that we see as they're becoming strengths and priorities in our lives that we can see they're connected to the blessing of God in his word, that God blesses those who are obedient. He promises that in his word, that he blesses those who are good stewards, and he blesses those who are generous like he's generous. And it's not about leaning into one of those and neglecting the others, but I really believe those three need to be key supports in your life, and as you make them that, then we can see the blessing of God in a tangible way. Well, this week we're going to continue forward in that. We're going to go a bit deeper into God's word and into this idea of how to live and experience a blessed life. If you'll just take your bulletin that you received today, or if you brought a notebook, or you can get a piece of paper, um, pull that out right now, and I want you to write something out with me and would encourage you to take notes along with this message to help you this week as you're processing and praying through um, God's word. How many know that his word says that we are not just to be hearers of his word, that's what we're doing right now, but to be doers of his word? That if we're hearers, we're like a person that just goes and looks in the mirror and then turns around and forgets what they look like. we got to put this into practice. Are you with me? My prayer is that you'll get something tangible today that you can live out and, and that the Lord would speak to your heart to, uh, to live differently. All right, are we ready? We are going to write a statement, and I need you to fill in the blank for yourself. So think about this, okay? 
and I want you to just kind of, whatever is the first thing that comes to mind, the first thing that maybe uh, causes you anxiety or causes you to worry or to, to, to feel stress in your life. Here's the statement. I don't have enough blank. I don't have enough blank. Whatever that is right now, whatever's coming to your heart, your mind, maybe it's that thing that you wake up thinking about or it's as you go to bed at the end of the day, you realize I, I don't have enough of this and, 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 and I need to need more of that, whatever it might be. Okay, so take a moment, fill that out. Just write that there at the top of your page, whether it's on your bulletin or wherever you have a chance to take notes. If you don't have anything to write with or you can't put it in your phone or whatever, just think of that in this moment. Fill in that blank. All right, are we ready? I'm not going to ask everyone to reveal that because some of you might have put something that's personal and you, you're not looking to be singled out. But I'm just going to share with you, um, if we would take a group this size and we would pull them, the number one and two answer would be in a room this size to that question is I don't have enough time, I don't have enough money. How many of you know what I'm talking about today? You guys didn't get as loud as first service. And when I said those two words, like, oh, yeah, that's me. Oh, yeah. Um, those are the two. Also, if you go to Google, which gives us a, a form of analytics, you can actually analyze what has been the most Googled phrases. In, in kind of if you start to type it out, then, then it would um, begin to reveal to you what the most searched phrases are. When you say, I don't have enough, the first two, top two, time, money. In fact, I just figured I would want to spread out the list so we can get to the top four. The, the top two, time, money, then the third one was spoons. And then the fourth one was faith. I, I don't get the spoon thing. Does anyone, did anyone write spoons? Just come on. That's the only thing I'm asking. Anyone write spoons? I don't understand how that is being searched for so often. Now I've become a parent. I think I realize it because when we look through our utensil drawer, the spoons are always missing. I think my kids are eating and then throwing them in the trash can like they're plastic spoons or something. So maybe that's just a young parent thing. I don't know. But, um, but let's focus on the first two. How about that? That time and money, I think that, that those are two things that create so much anxiety in our lives, frustration. I'm just going to ask just about time. How many of you have said at some point in time, I don't have enough time? I just don't feel like I have enough time. Did anyone, would anyone be willing to just disclose that you wrote that on your piece of paper today? Come on, anyone here? I don't have enough time. Yeah, that's one that, that, that's one that many people uh, wrestle with and struggle with, and, and money as well. Here's what I've realized, though, because when we look at this, I don't have enough, and we point at whatever that is that we feel is lacking, we often think we have a provision problem, that it's a provision problem. There's not enough time that's been given to me or enough money that I've received that, it, that the problem is provisional. But I want to challenge you today as we explore God's word that I don't believe the problem is provision as much as it might be a pattern problem, that there's some patterns that might be broken in our lives that are actually producing the problem. So it's not the provision necessarily that's an issue. I can tell you it's not the provision problem when it comes to time. I can assure that because guess what? Look at the neighbor next to you. They have exactly as many hours this week as you do. And so do I and so do you. And we have exactly as many hours this day as each other have. God isn't creating more time for any of us unless he's extending the number of our years. But often when we're saying we don't have enough time, it's not that we need more years on this earth. We need more time today or this week or to accomplish what's on the list in front of us. Make sense? So I want you to understand that that issue, I don't believe, is a provision issue. I believe it's a pattern issue. That if we get patterns right in our lives, patterns that honor God, because God talks about in his word this idea of patterns. And as you study it, you begin to see it more and more and more that the pattern in your life might actually produ be producing the problem contributing to it and developing the right patterns might be a part of the solution to answer that issue of I don't have enough, whatever it might be. Oftentimes, we look at someone else's life and we see the blessing that's in their life and we want the blessing. We want to just run after that. We want to experience, we want to live at that level. But we, we often get disappointed to realize is we haven't developed the patterns in our lives that result in that blessing. Are you with me? We can go and we could see someone that runs a marathon and we can say, I'm going to go run the, the Boston Marathon as well. And you begin to run and there you are at the back of the pack and you're so mad and you're like, well, I wish you would have just given me more strength, God. I wish, Lord, you would have given me more endurance. I wish that you would have given me more sustenance or whatever. And the Lord's like, no, just develop the right patterns. Those people are winning those marathons because they've developed patterns of running and endurance that are growing them. But often we want to live at a level we haven't 
develop patterns to support in our lives. Is that making sense still? We're going to just explore this just a little bit further. A little bit more about patterns. Um, habits in your life. It's another good word for that. All that habits are, are repeated patterns of behavior. Habits are formed by repeated patterns of behavior. You do the same thing over and over and over again, and it becomes a habit in your life. Every one of us in here, we have healthy habits, good habits, and we have bad habits in our lives. Those are formed by repeated patterns of behavior. Here's also the thing about patterns. Patterns reveal your priorities in your life. That which you are continually repeating, giving your time, giving your focus, giving your energy, giving your resources towards, it is showing that that's a priority in your life. And some of us, if we would really get out of denial and embrace that, we would reveal that we have some pretty bad priorities. And we say, that's not a priority. It's just a little thing over here. No, it's not because you're feeding it with so much of your life. It's a, it's, it's a priority. It's a priority more than you think it's a priority. So there are things in our lives that are wrong that might even be sinful, and we don't even realize it, but it's, a prior, it's become a priority. Why? Because we have so many patterns and habits we've formed around it. We're giving so much of our energy to it. It's, it's a priority being lifted up. Now, patterns also, this is where it gets dangerous. Patterns not just reveal your priorities, they reinforce your priorities. That the more that you repeat a behavior and develop a pattern around something, the more you strengthen that. Well, if it's healthy and good, then guess what? That's where you're growing. That's where you're winning marathons. That's where you're seeing some really amazing things and even blessing from God. But when it's unhealthy things, the Bible talks about a stronghold. Have you ever heard about a stronghold? Strongholds are formed by repeated patterns of behavior, sinful behavior, wrong behavior, thinking, whatever it might be. God has a lot to say about patterns, but I think one of the best verses that you can find hope in today is found in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Here's what it says. I urge you, therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. I want to tell you that these kids were beautiful today, but the singing of songs is not the only way that God looks for worship. That our lives are meant to worship God. Our songs are meant to be ultimately the byproduct of what's going on inside of our hearts. That we lift our hearts, that we lift our voice, that we lift our song. That it's an outward expression of the inward reality of what we feel inside of our hearts. So he says, give your whole lives, your whole bodies, all that you are, become a living sacrifice. Make your life priority to worship God. And he said, as that happens, that's, that's what God looks for. That's what he desires. But look at the next part. Do not conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. So this is the reality here. God's word says, look, live a life that's set apart unto God. Live a life that worships him, that honors him. In the same way that, do we think these words that we sang, the worship today, please God, that the children led us in? Absolutely, I believe that. Their hearts were lifted before the Lord. And we can stand with a confidence today, believing that God is pleased as he hears that worship. Are you with me today? As we gather corporately, I believe that that honors the heart of God. When we come together on Wednesday nights and we pray, it honors the heart of God. Here's what I want to ask you to really check ourselves. When I'm living outside of my time in church, when God looks over my life, does it honor him? Does it honor him in that kind of way? I'm not talking about to walk around singing worship choruses all day, but is the way I'm living my life an act of worship unto him? Are you with me? And we all got quiet because it's like, wow, I don't know. I don't know. But what if we just ask that question and say, Lord, I want it to be. Does anyone here desire that to be the case in your life? I do. I want my life to honor God. I want, my, I want when the Lord not just looks at my singing, but looks at the way I'm living and looks at the things that I'm doing when no one else is looking, and he's pleased not indifferent. He's pleased. I want you to know God isn't just watching us when we're in church. Are you with me today? God desires for our whole lives because we give our whole lives to him. So he says, look, I want, I want to set you free. That's what the Lord's saying to you today. I want to set you free from the patterns of this world because many of us today have been conformed to the patterns of this world. Our hearts have been, have been so drawn towards things that are not aligned to God's purposes, not aligned to God's will. 
I want you to just turn on television, just watch the commercials. Everything about it is trying to shape us in a certain way. We are being shaped by the world around us. Does that make sense? My kids like to play with Play-Doh a lot, and, and there's all kinds of different molds, and whatever we put in front of them, it's going to be shaped. So if it's cars or if it's baking or if it's whatever, it's being conformed to that image. I want you to know the world that you're living in, what you're watching, who you're spending time with, how you're managing the hours of your day and the hours of your life, it's all shaping you into something. There's an image, a pattern that you're fitting to. But the Lord says, don't be, don't be conformed anymore. I'm going to tell you something. I don't want to be shaped by the patterns of this world. I don't want to be shaped. I don't want to be conformed to that. I want to have a life that's shaped by God's word, his priorities, by the transforming of my mind. So the answer here is this. Don't be conformed. Be transformed. You know what that song was all about we just sang? I've been changed. I've been transformed by what Christ has done. So how does that happen? By the renewing of your mind, the Bible says. And what that does is, when your mind is renewed, the patterns of this world become broken. And you begin to lean into the pattern that God has for your life, to be shaped by him. And the greatest way to discover that and understand that is by looking to God's word. And God's word shows us patterns over and over and over again. But one of the first patterns that I believe we need to be set free from is the pattern of what I'll call mammon. If you'll look in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, in that verse... Jesus is speaking, and he's saying something. We talked about it last week, Matthew 6, 24. Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and, say it with me, money. Now, in the King James Version, anyone here prefer the King James? You know, you grew up on that. Or you, that word isn't money. Does anyone remember what that word is? Mammon. Mammon, it's a word in the Greek that really didn't just talk about money. It talked about so much more than money. It talked about this Syrian god of wealth and prosperity called Mammon. And this shows up time and again in a few pers- uh, portions of Scripture. We don't have enough time to go into them, but you can actually see Mammon, this word showing up. And it was a god of wealth, of materialism of chasing after more, and many were swept up in worship to this idea of mammon. People were get laying their, their lives down to try to please this God of mammon, to get more. And what Jesus saw and needed to call out is these people call themselves God's people, but they're worshiping mammon. Now, they wouldn't say they're worshiping mammon. They don't know. We don't go to his temple. He saying, no, by the way you're living your life, you're worshiping him. He doesn't need to get you to show up at his temple to worship him. You're doing it by the way you're acting. By the way you're prioritizing wealth, this spirit, this attitude, this disposition of it has seeped into your heart and into your life. Church, I still feel that this God, this spirit, this attitude is so pervasive in the world today. And just because we're sitting in church doesn't mean we're exempt from it. This is an attitude, a mindset of more, a mindset of wanting wealth, of wanting all the wrong things, things that... Things that are are not about God's kingdom and character, but about feeding our own selfish desires. Are you with me? Some are like, I don't want to be with you. You're hurting my feelings as you're talking, Pastor. So mammon. I believe that one of the things God wants to do is he wants to break this pattern of mammon. He wants to break the, the, the whole mold, the behaviors, the things that are supporting that. And he wants to develop patterns that honor him in our lives. So today we're going to discover four patterns that we see in God's word. These aren't the only four, but I believe that they are four patterns that as you develop them in your life, they can result in the blessing of God upon your life. So again, last week we talked about pillars. They're like big priorities, obedience and, 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 and stewardship and, and generosity. But today we've got to make sure we're developing patterns that are reinforcing that, that are supporting those pillars, supporting the priorities that we place in our lives. Are you ready for the four? We're going to go one at a time if you're taking notes. The first pattern is to develop a pattern of planning, a pattern of planning in your life. The key word to write down here in your notes is intentionality, that there needs to be a sense of intentionality in the way that we are living our lives. I feel like so often some are living, running through every single day, and you're just trying to survive. Someone today 
is feeling that way. You're here and you're saying, you know, I just feel like I'm going through the motions. I'm just trying to keep my head above water. And I'm not, I don't feel there's any intentionality. I'm just feeling barraged and whatever fire is there in front of me, I'm putting it out and I'm just chasing after it. And I promise you this, that we cannot live our lives running from every fire and emergency back and forth and expect to move forward in the things that God has for us. We're living our lives by accident, but I want you to know God has created you for a purpose, so begin to live your life with purpose. Purpose is connected to planning. What I'm not saying here today is that you need to go away somewhere, avoid avoid from God, and figure out what you want to do with your life. I don't believe that's the way we go about planning as followers of Christ, that we instead, we're coming to the Lord and we're saying, Lord, help us to understand the plan. Help us to understand how to live our lives with intentionality. It's about slowing down enough to actually put together, count the cost, understand the big picture, understand where things are and where they're moving. Look what Jesus says in Luke 14, 28. He he says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first go and sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? He said, don't you put together a plan before you build? And you know what he's talking about? He's talking to followers. People that want to follow me, he says, if anyone wants to follow me, deny yourself. Take up your cross, follow me, but count the cost first. Plan it out. Make sure. Young man wanted to come and, a uh, rich young ruler wanted to come and follow Jesus. And he said, no, no, there's, there's part of it here. Count the cost. Go sell everything you have. Give it to the poor. Then come. Be my disciple. Jesus is looking for intentionality, planning, understanding of that. God is a God of planning. I, in fact, he put together the whole idea of the tabernacle. And I've read, when I do my reading, my Bible reading, I'm in the Old Testament. And how many of you know what I'm talking about? That you'll go through chapters where it's all, I'm like, we're still talking about this tent of meeting? We're still talking about this tabernacle and what kind of cloth? And I'm like, how is this applicable in my life today? I don't understand it. But you know what I stepped back and realized as I was preparing for the message today? Maybe God wants me just to know how much he cares about planning and intentionality. And then then a deeper revelation hit my heart because not only does it show up in the tabernacle that God is so specific about how he wants it planned out and how he wants it laid out, that then I look at the temple, and the temple, same way, God had very specific plans on how he desired the temple to be constructed. And then I get to the New Testament, and because Jesus died and rose from the dead, the Bible says when you go to Israel, there's not a temple there right now, but where is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Here. Here. So there was intentionality and planning, intentionality and planning, and we think we can get by on just going by whatever. Wow, right? That became a revelation in my heart. Like, Lord, maybe you want me to live with more intentionality in my life. Hey, I'm all about being led by the Holy Spirit, but sometimes we blame the Holy Spirit for all kinds of bad habits we have. I was just being spirit-led. I didn't need to work on that. The Holy Spirit got me. No. God is a God of order, and he's a God of planning. But here's what I love is that God did not say, go build my temple and figure it out. Go build the tabernacle and figure it out for yourself. The Lord had a plan. Look at your neighbor and say, God has a plan. So it isn't as much of you of you creating a plan as it is you discerning a plan. It's about you cooperating with God in prayer and saying, Lord, what is the plan? And as you pray and as you feel that, it becomes clearer and clearer. And make sure you take enough time to write it out and spell it out and plan it out. Does that make sense? So we need to develop patterns of planning, not just a one-time thing, but how are you creating regular patterns of planning in your life that can result in intentionality and a greater pursuit of God? I promise you, God will bless that. If you make your own plans and you get away on the side, Proverbs talks about that. That's not it, you know, Um, because in in, in man's own heart, when you're planning on your own, you're going to miss it. But you plan with God. You work with him. You pray. You seek him. And the Lord honors that. We see this idea of planning as a key aspect of stewardship and that's one of the key pillars of blessing we talked about last week it requires planning and intentionality in fact one of the stewards the servants that's honored in matthew 25 he was strategic he had a plan for how he was going to handle that which was entrusted to him and so he did it and he did it faithfully and look what the master said to him in verse 21 Well done, good and faithful servant. Don't you want to hear that one day? When we enter into the presence of God, well done, good and faithful servant. You've done well with what I've entrusted to you, the life I've given you, the children I've given you, the spouse I've given you, the resources I've given you, the time I've given you. Enter into my joy. And he said, because you've been faithful with a few things, I will put many things 
before you, put you in charge of many things. Come and share in my happiness. For some of you today, if you wrote in that line, I don't have enough money. We don't have enough money. If finances is a struggle, and we know when you just look over the state of America, um, we're not, many of us are not exempt from that. You could feel the, the restraints, the constraints of finances as a reality. Say, I don't have enough money. I just feel so stretched, so difficult. I would challenge you today, create a budget. Create a budget. Say it with me. Create a budget. What is a budget? A budget is a plan for your money. It's a plan for the provision that comes in. Some of you are like, I don't want to create a budget because every month then I'm going to freak out because it's not going to add up. Can I tell you that some of you, when you create that budget, what you're going to see the following months as you continue to honor the Lord, you're going to see the miraculous because God can make things work that weren't working. And you don't even realize, some of you are living by the grace of God, you don't even realize how much God is showing up, how much he's providing, how much he's filling in the gaps because you're not taking time to plan it out and look at it. That intentionality can reveal a lot in our hearts and lives. I'm going to give you a resource. Uh, write this down in your notes, DaveRamsey.com. Dave, D-A-V-E, Ramsey, R-A-M-S-E-Y.com. He has amazing free resources. Uh, we totally support Financial Peace University. Um, talk to us if you want to figure out how to go through something like that. We went through that Dave Ramsey course, my wife and I, changed our life, changed our marriage, changed so many things. We were able to pay off debt. We were able to save like never before. We were able to develop patterns in our lives that were healthy. And as a young married couple, it was years ago, um, God worked so deeply in us, um, and we really felt like that helped prepare us for our family and for other things because of what happened in that time. So go there. You can get free resources, free budgeting tools, but also you can find more things to help you in that area if that's what you wrote or if that's what you're feeling in your life. So planning. We got it? We ready for the second one? We need to develop patterns of saving. Patterns of saving. There's a word that you want to put here, and the word that I would put underneath savings is margin. We talk about margin a lot uh, on staff and in and, and our leadership and things. We especially talk about time margin. Your life is meant to be lived with margin. You're not meant to be living your life at 110%. There should be a sense of being able to live beneath that, to live below that. There's wisdom in saving. God's word talks about this over and over again. We see different times, but I, I was really drawn to Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6 through 8 today uh, to share with you. And look what it says. And I wish that God was, it, it hurt my feelings when I read it. The Lord hurt my feelings with this word. Um, it says, go to the ant, you sluggard. Oh my God, thanks, Lord. <laughs> Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer, no ruler, yet it stores its provision in the summer and it gathers its food at harvest. It learns this idea of saving, not spending everything as soon as it receives it. Because whenever we do that, if we live that way and we just consume everything, 100 plus percent, because these beautiful things called credit cards got invented, the most demonic thing in the world, I feel like, right? It's like, look, you, you don't have enough, don't worry, just borrow more and it'll be okay. And now people are living in crippling debt. You know what I'm talking about, right? So many are living at 120, 130, 150% of what they have coming in. When the Lord says, no, no, don't live that way. Live, live with less and save and store away and allow that wisdom. Create patterns of saving. So, Pastor, I don't have hundreds and thousands of dollars I could save. Start a pattern. Pattern can start very small, but watch it grow. Watch it get healthier. Watch it move. But there should be a, a mentality, an attitude, an understanding of this. Look in God's word, even in, in, in the account of Joseph in Egypt. He's there, and God reveals, listen, I'm going to bring about blessing for a season. And what I want you to do is don't consume all that blessing. Save it. Save it. Live on what you live on, but then put the rest away. Don't, don't up your standard of living to meet the new increase because this is a seasonal blessing. Store it away because there's famine coming. When the famine comes, you'll live off the famine. You'll live off the excess I poured in. I believe God works in the same ways in our lives, and it's through having this pattern of saving in our lives that can result in provision, blessing. I would tell you that the whole world looked at Egypt during that seven years of drought and say, there's the blessing of God. Was God opening up heaven during that time and pouring down food? No, God had already blessed them, and now the blessing was being realized. Some of you 
are going to experience the blessing of God, not today, but when you save, it's going to be a deferred blessing. And later on, you're going to stand in the blessing of God and say, wow, Lord, you blessed me back then. I didn't even realize you were blessing me for this day, for this hour. On, on, on November 10th, I'm blessed because I had a pattern of saving that allowed me to experience that. Is that making sense? Are you with me? Again, I'm sure that in, in Egypt and all around the world, everyone thought it was a provision problem. And guess what? If those years of drought had come and they had done nothing to prepare, they would have been saying provision problem, provision problem, provision problem. And the Lord, maybe through Joseph, said, no, pattern problem, pattern. I told you we had to have a pattern of saving, and we didn't do it. Thank God they did, and now we see the result of that, that they had seven years to sustain them. May the same be said of us, that we have patterns, healthy patterns of saving. Got it? All right, so the first one, what was it? Planning. Second one? Saving. Okay. Third one is patterns of resting. Patterns of resting. Can I tell you that this has been the most convicting point in my heart this week? Your pastor has to preach this message to myself before I give it to you. You know that, right? It has to filter through me. It's not easy sometimes, but I know it's helpful. It's helping me. It's ministering to me. The Lord's speaking to me through even this point right here. Patterns of resting. The word I want you to write below this is Sabbath. Say it with me, Sabbath. I'm not talking about the 80s rock band, Black Sabbath. We're not talking about that. We're talking about this biblical principle that God has laid out from the beginning. Sabbath is spelled S-A-B-B-A-T-H if you're writing notes. Sabbath. So let's go back in Genesis. The Bible teaches that there are an account of, of days, and on each day God did something. How many of those days did it take for God to create the world? Six. And then on the seventh day, what did he do? He rested. Think about that for a moment, okay? God created the whole world, everything we see, in that period of time, six. And there was leftover. There was enough there. He rested. He rested from all his work. Can I tell you that I never saw or realized Genesis chapter 2, verse 3, until we're going through this series? And because of that, the Lord began to speak to my heart and minister and challenge me. Some of you have never seen this before either. Look what it says about that seventh day. I want you to read it with me. Ready? Genesis 2, 3. Put it up on the screen. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. What did God do with the seventh day? Blessed it. God blessed his rest. He blessed a day of rest. He blessed the Sabbath. He blessed this day, made it set apart, made it holy. What happens when we honor the Sabbath? What happens if you would readjust your life? Because you are working 24-7. You are, if you're like so many other people around you, you wrote on that, I don't have enough time. And you hear this idea that God took a day and he took a whole day off? You got to be kidding me. I could never live. The whole world would burn down. Everything, my family would fall apart. Are you kidding me? I could never, I don't even have enough time working seven days. Maybe it's not a provision problem. Maybe it's a pattern problem. Maybe you're one decision away in this area of resting to changing the whole equation. God bless that seven day. Here's what I realize that comes into our minds. I don't have enough time to do this. Would anyone say, I feel like I don't have enough time to rest? Your pastor's hand is up. Anyone else? Come on, be a moment of honesty. God's watching. He knows what you're feeling already. You don't have to lie. You don't have to live in denial here. I feel like I, I feel too busy to do this. To do this. This is, no, I don't think so. I'm too busy. i got stuff to do. We look at all our lists. We look at all the things we create and we do. And we say, you know, I, I, need, I need all the days. I need all seven. I need all the hours. God created the whole world. And there he is. He established a day of rest. And he blessed it. Can I tell you that some of us were not entering into and experiencing the fullness of God's blessing because we're not resting in him? Is that hard to hear? But I, I believe it. That I believe that God has a blessing tied into this idea of Sabbath and rest and experiencing that. I believe this about, about this idea of rest and about Sabbath, that God blesses six days to produce, produce, produce more than seven days can produce on its own in your own strength. 
Six days in God's hand, honoring God, will always produce more than seven, eight, or nine days in your own hands. I can show you. You want to see a great example of it? Study Chick-fil-A's model. Anyone know what I'm talking about, Chick-fil-A? How many of you have, have had uh, some, some thoughts for the Lord on Sundays when you've shown up trying to go to some Chick-fil-A? Come on, Lord. Can't you at least, can't they pick a different day? They picked a day. They're a Christian company, Christian values, and they said, this is what we believe. We believe for our workers that they need to have a day of rest. We believe that for our company, we believe God's going to honor that. And everyone else, seven days a week. I mean, that's the great thing that companies can have. We're open seven days a week. And yet when you study the market reports, Chick-fil-A is now like the third most profitable uh, food business in the world. I mean, the profit, like, they're just skyrocketing. The and they're doing it six days a week. Everyone else is doing it seven days a week. Can you imagine that? They're just being blessed. They're experiencing this blessing. Do you think it's connected to that? I do. It's not just the great chicken. I love their chicken, whatever. It's their obedience in that area. I believe it. They have a pattern of rest that's resulting in blessing. Wow, that sounds familiar. Yes, God talks about it over and over and over again in his word. Rest and I'll bless. Watch. Don't rest. <laughs> what, are we, what, are we, what are we losing out on? We're losing out on blessing. We're losing out on what the Lord would want to do. Not only did this speak to me, but do you know that back in the, in the Old Testament, there was times when people would plant their crops, and the Lord had this crazy idea. I'll call it crazy because you're going to think it's crazy when you hear it. That he said, listen, here's what I want you to do. Not only on the seventh day do I want you to rest, but I want you when you plant your crops and you're harvesting them, I want you to plant for six years, and on the seventh year, you don't plant anything. On the seventh year, I want you to let the land rest. For a whole year, Lord? Are you kidding me? What, I mean, what is that? No, like, I, I don't think so. How are we going to eat? And then the Lord answers the question. Look at it in, in, in Leviticus chapter 25, verse 20. You might ask, what will we eat on the seventh year if we do not plant or harvest our crops? Look at verse 21. I will send you such a blessing in the sixth year that the land will yield enough for three more years. Come on, somebody. Like, like honor me in the sixth year. Watch what I do. I'll give you enough for three. I'll just give you the seventh year. I'll give you seventh, eighth, and ninth year. And then whenever you continue to plant... On the eighth year, in the ninth year, now what can you do? Save. See it? Patterns. Patterns are forming, and the Lord's honoring. And then he says, now I want you to take that. Not only do you, do you take all that, but then the Lord says, I want you to give. Even on the seventh year, he said, anyone comes into your land, they want to take some fruit, whatever, give. This is what leads us into our fourth pattern in your life that comes from God's word that I see so clearly. It's patterns of giving. It's patterns around giving. Whenever you just take this idea, and uh, next week I'm so looking forward to the message that you're going to hear. Um, it's going to be one that I think is going to speak to all, all of our hearts and minister deeply. But he says, I want you to take from even your crops, and I want you to bring the first fruits to me. Give them to the Lord. First fruits. And we're going we're gonna to understand some more about that in the weeks to come. But, but he says, I want you to give. I want you to take, and I want you to give. And then you live off the rest. So we see this idea here of giving. Giving is so important to the heart of God. It's so tied into the heart of God. For God so loved us, he gave his son. Giving is something that just comes from the, the heart of God. And it's a part of what he pours out. But as God does this, he teaches us something. Jesus said this, and we learn it through the apostle Paul, as he's at the end of his life in Acts chapter 20, verse 35. He's, he's talking, he's saying, listen, you got to keep giving. Make sure you give to the work of God. Make sure you support people that are in need. Make sure you support the weak among you. And he says this, in everything I did, I showed you that this, by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. And I remembered the words of the Lord Jesus himself. Look at these words. It is more blessed to give than to receive. It is more blessed to give than to receive. This is what he says. Powerful, powerful statement. Because many of us like, no, I, I feel pretty blessed when I receive. I feel really blessed when I receive, Lord. I promise you. If someone came today and they gave you a car, you would feel a blessing. You would feel so blessed. How many of you would feel blessed today with a new car? I don't have one to give out. I'm sorry. Don't get your hopes up. But I pray one day I could. Because I know what it was like to be blessed 
but I know that those who bless and are able to give, I'll be more blessed if I could give one away than if I could receive one. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? It happens in missions all the time. We go and say, I'm going to be a blessing. I'm going to be a blessing. And then they, they go and you pour yourself out and then you leave and like, oh, I was more blessed. I feel like something got che- cheated here because I, I went there to give a blessing and I got the blessing. That's what happens. It's more blessed to give than to receive. So we see this. So it has, there has to be a pattern around our giving um, that is connected to blessing. It's connected to it. And in Malachi chapter 3, the prophet's speaking to people because they're saying something's broken. We don't feel like the provision's coming. We don't feel like we're seeing God show up. We, don't, we got a provision problem, God. And God said, you don't got a provision problem. You got a pattern problem. And he said, your pattern problem is around your giving. He actually goes on to tell the people they're robbing the Lord. He says, you're stealing from me. And they say in verse 8, like, he says, would a mere mortal rob God? You, yet you rob me. And they said, how are we robbing you? He said, in the tithes and the offerings. And you're under a curse, your whole nation, because you're robbing me. The Lord said, there's a, an unhealthy pattern that's formed. I mean, the children of Israel, they were literally living under the provision of God. And they decided, we're not going to give back to you, God. And he says, no, like, you're wondering what's wrong. This is what's wrong. And he speaks to them. Verse 10, this is what he says. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. This idea of tithe is the word tenth. It's a tenth of, of what you receive. In the Old Testament, that's what they would do. They would take everything they received and they would give a tenth of it. This predates Moses. This predates the law. Some would say, well, I know that idea of tithe. I think that's just the Old Testament law. And whenever Jesus came, that like got, you know, it, it fulfilled the law of Moses. It predates the law of Moses. It goes all the way back to Abraham. Before the law, before the Ten Commandments, for anything, Abraham and Melchizedek, who was a priest, when Abraham saw him, he blessed him and they gave him a tenth of all that he had. It was to God. He was giving it to the Lord. This idea of this tithe, this tenth, goes so far back in God's word. It goes all the way back to the early parts where the Lord asked for an offering. And we see the two brothers came and they brought an offering before the Lord to please his heart. And one was his first and best and that honored the heart of God. So this idea of giving has always been there since the beginning. So we see tithe, and he says, you know, this is the area. It's in the tithe. Test me in this. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And then he says, test me in this. Say that with me. Test me. The Lord says, test me in this. He doesn't say test me anywhere else. He says, don't test me. Don't test the Lord. But he opens the door and says, no, no, in this area. Why? Because Jesus said it. Your treasure and your heart are so connected. The Lord knows this is so near to so many of our hearts, so, so difficult, such a struggle. More than anything else we're talking about, like, yeah, Lord, I'll go take a nap, but keep away from my checkbook. Um, I'll rest. That sounds good. But this area, whew, so much of our, our, our identity is found in this. So much of our fear and our anxiety is connected to our money. He says, so test me in this, says the Lord. See if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven. And pour out so much blessing that there won't be enough room for you to store. This isn't your pastor giving his opinion. This is what God's word is telling us. And he said, I will prevent the pests from devouring your crops. And the vines of your fields will not drop their fruit before they're ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you what? Blessed. For yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. There are people that I look at and I, and I call them blessed. And a part of that blessing is here. I know they're obedient. I know that they, they, they tithe. They're good stewards, and they're generous. And I just see the blessing of God all over their lives. I want my life to look like that. I want your life to look like that. Amen? Amen. And that's what he says. People, the, the world, like, oh, like, wow, there's blessing. I can see the blessing of God all over you. What is that? It's like, because I'm not hold, hoarding it in. I'm, let, I'm, just, I'm just being obedient. I'm just pouring it out before the Lord. And he invited me to test him, and I did. And the Lord is, the Lord is blessing me. And how many of you know that blessing isn't all about dollar signs or Lamborghinis or cars? It's deeper than that. You can have all that stuff and have no blessing in your life. You could feel so empty. You could feel so depleted. You know why? Because you have stuff, but the devourer is still there. You know why I believe many aren't experienced? Because we have our stuff, but there's still mammon out there. This, this God, this reality, this mindset, and we're feeding that. And guess what? If you have a million, you know how much you need? A million and one or two million. He will tell you it's never enough. Mammon will tell you you need more. He will tell you not to slow down. Don't rest. There's more out there on the table for you to get. And some of us are wondering why we're so broken. Because the patterns that we've been conformed to are patterns of mammon, not patterns that God has for us. 
All these patterns that we're talking about are so anti um, what our mind would tell us is right. And yet God says, test me, watch me, watch how I work in the midst of this. Are you still with me, church? I invite the worship team to come forward at this time. He says, all the nations will call you blessed. So patterns of giving. There's two that I want to just talk to you about briefly as we get ready to close. Tithe and offering is what this passage talks about. It's what God's word talks about as forms of giving. The tithe is what I would see as obedience. So you write that word obedience there. Tithe is something God has put in his word. says, do this when you give. He didn't say if you pray, if you, if you fast, if you give. No, when you pray, when you fast, when you give. It's a part of this regular pattern. So a pattern of tithe, a pattern of giving um, first to the Lord. And then offering is generosity. That's going above and beyond what you determine in your own heart. The Lord established what a tithe is. He gave it a very name, a tithe, tenth. But then the offering is this above and beyond whatever the Lord puts in your heart. So in our family, the tithe comes first, and then above that we determine in our hearts what the Lord's put there, and we make that a pattern of giving above and beyond. But then, like, if you look in your seat back in front of you today, you'll see a picture of these Thanksgiving meals. That's something that comes up every year. We provide, like, 400 meals for families. So what we do is we, we give to this offering, and it comes up, and you have the opportunity you could fill that out, put money in there, and that feeds a family. We'll say, yes. So we'll do it sometimes, not spontaneously, but as a, as a need comes before us. But there is a regular time to missions and, and to what the Lord puts in our heart. We give that and we make that a pattern. Are you with me still? Not every so often or irregularly, but we want to make it a pattern in our lives. So for us, what we realized is that the best way to form those patterns is by automating things in our lives. We realized we had automated our mortgage payment. We had auto automated our bills. We had automated all kinds of things. So a couple years ago, Mandy and I, we said, let's automate our giving. So online on evangelchurch.com and our giving, we, and through PushPay, we have a way that we can make recurring giving. So we say, we know what's coming in each month. And so we're going to just automate that and plan that that goes out. And what we like to do is we like it to be first. And we'll talk more about that in the weeks to come. But, but we, we make it a priority. We say, we don't want it to be at the end of the month if there's enough. No, we, we say, God, we trust you first. And we, we trust that you're going to take care of everything else, and he's faithful to do that. So today I want you to now take a moment, pull out that paper that you have in front of you. You've written some notes there. I don't have enough blank. But you've also seen these patterns that need to be formed. I want you to take a moment, and I want you to highlight the one area, the bottom there somewhere. What is the number one area you feel the Lord's speaking to you about today? that you feel like this is something I got, I got to develop this pattern. This pattern has to grow in my life and our family and whatever. Write that down right now. And if you know the step you need to take, whatever that looks like, not just the pattern, but what do I need to do now, you can begin to write that. Then after that, I want you to write the second area. What's the second one that really stood out to you, the area you know I need to, there needs to be a pattern, a habit being formed in my life around this. I want you to take those top two, and we're going to pray about it in just a moment. And I believe that as we pray, the Lord's going to help us. He's going to grow us. He's going to strengthen us. And he's going to help us develop patterns that I believe will produce blessing because they're patterns that align with God's will in his heart. Amen? So come on, would you join me in prayer right now? Lord Jesus, we come before you. We thank you today. Just as we sang today, Lord, we're building our lives not upon ourselves or upon the patterns of this world, but upon you, Lord God upon what you've revealed to us in your word and in your character and in your heart. And today, Lord, you've shown us these four patterns, Lord God, these four areas you've revealed. And Lord, you've been speaking to all of our hearts, Lord God. Lord, we've identified these areas that need to change, that need to develop, Lord. Right now, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would help us, Lord. You give us strength not just to be hearers of your word, but to be doers, Lord God, to take steps, Lord God, to build habits, Lord God, to begin to take action in these areas, Lord God, to trust you, to serve you, to honor you, Lord God. And I thank you, Lord, that the end result will be blessing. I thank you, Lord God, that you'll honor your word, Lord God, in every life. I pray for each person here today that's heard from your word, Lord God that you would speak to them clearly, that you'd minister to their hearts, and that you would make us people, Lord God, that can honor your heart. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God. Would you stand to your feet with me today? And here's what I want to tell you, even about giving. I know that it gets uncomfortable when we talk about giving here at Evangel or any church, really. And I feel it. I can feel it, and I'm sure you could feel it. Here's what I always want you to know about us. We're not, we, we don't feel a pressure like the offerings are down or we're having trouble meeting bills or anything like that. 
that none of that's driving this. In fact, this is a year of blessing. We're experiencing God's blessing, but I believe truly it's because we've been obedient, we've been good stewards, and we're being generous. And as we're being generous, the Lord pours in. He does that over and over again. So this isn't something I want from you or we want from you as a church. It's something we want for you. It's something I pray for you. I want you to be able to walk in God's blessing, his best, and honor him. And as you do that, God is going to, he's going to do more than we could ever think or imagine. Amen? So I just want to pray for you now, God's blessing on you as you get ready to go. And I'm going to invite our prayer team to come forward. If there's anything we can join with you in prayer around, we would love to. But let's just pray right now. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this series. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the teaching that you're able to show us. Uh, Lord, me included, I just thank you, Lord, that you're challenging and growing us into the people that you would desire for us to be. So Lord, take all these words, Lord, let it find good root in our hearts, Lord God, and send us from this place, Lord God. We pray, bless us, Lord. Lord God, as we obey you, that we can be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you as you go today. Um, avail yourself to everything out in the foyer. And if you need prayer, please come forward. We'd love to pray with you.